Daniel chapter 10, we are coming to the end of our time in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 10 through Daniel chapter 12 is one vision that summarizes the end of human history. From Daniel's day all the way until Christ comes again in glory. And so some of the events in Daniel 10 through 12 have already happened. Some have yet to happen for us. Through this one final vision, Daniel is convinced that this world is not his home. We need to be encouraged in that manner also. We need to be encouraged to wait for something better than this world has to offer. The writer of Hebrews put it like this, For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. So the good news is that things are never the way that they appear in this world. This is important for us to realize because the world around us continually argues that mankind is either the cause for the world's successes or the excuse for the world's failures. How many times have we heard recently that the reason that the world is in the shape that it's in, whether it's you know, through ecology or biology or whatever it is, it's all our fault. But then the world also tells us, if things are going to get better, it's up to who? It's up to you to change things and to make it better. Friends, the vision in Daniel 10 through 12 encourages us that humanity is never the final arbiter of human history. God is. Now, I think that the devil would love to have each one of us view this world in an unspiritual or naturalistic way. He would love for us to view the world like that because if we are encouraged to see the world like that, then the byproduct is that we're tricked into thinking that we are not engaged in a spiritual war. Spiritual warfare that's spoken about in Daniel 10 through 11, 1. It should shock us. It should wake us up to the reality that there are spiritual forces at play in this world. And those forces are opposed to the cause of Christ. Friends, we are engaged in a spiritual war. The final vision of Daniel tells us that. It also encourages us that the triune God of the Bible will bring believers to ultimate victory through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look at three things today in Daniel 10 through 11. 1. We're going to look at the first three verses that describe a very troubling time for Daniel. Second, in verses 4 through 9, we will look at the divine messenger, the Lord Jesus Christ, verses 4 through 9. And then third and finally, we're going to learn the realities of spiritual warfare. Daniel 10, 10 through 11, 1. Open your Bibles and read with me, verses 1 through 3. Troubling times. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was, was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. It's the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. This is an important date. If you studied world history, you would know that in the first year of King Cyrus, Cyrus made a decree that the conquered peoples in his kingdom could go home. You see, Cyrus had inherited, by way of military victory, the kingdom of Babylon. And Cyrus viewed things differently than the Babylonians. Instead of a conqueror, Cyrus wanted to be a liberator. And so he liberated the Jewish people. He told them, go home, 
rebuild your city, rebuild your temple. And he gave them money in order to do both of those things. The first year of Cyrus was an incredible year. Everyone was excited. This is a new world, they thought. New possibilities. New money funding it all. The Jews went home. They began their rebuilding. By the third year of Cyrus, the building of the temple had stopped. The building of the walls of Jerusalem and the city had stopped. These were troubling times. You see, the Jews were opposed by outside forces. The Samaritans had kind of formed this kind of political rivalry that caused the Jews to stop. Stop building. Stop working on the temple. Cause the Jews to look within. Let's focus on ourselves again, not on God. Daniel's not in Jerusalem. He's still in Babylon. But Daniel is discouraged about the things that are happening hundreds of miles away. Friends, there are spiritual realities at work behind the scenes in this world. Those nefarious forces cause the temple to be stopped. Daniel understands this. And so he uses one of the great spiritual weapons in our war. He prays and he fasts. Now you'll probably notice in verses 2 and 3 that Daniel's fasting is not complete. It's not as if he gives up all food, all water. Instead, he doesn't eat the delicacies, the good food of life. He gives up meat, wine, and oil for his skin. And he does this for three whole weeks. Here's the point. Daniel had a connection with the people of God in other places around this world. You see, it would have been tempting for him to be only concerned with the realities that were happening in Babylon where he is. We have to be truthful and say that life in Babylon was not all that bad. Daniel was well fed. He had pretty much anything he wanted. He was in the royal court. Life in Babylon was actually pretty good. But life away from Babylon, back in Jerusalem, was awful. Daniel cared about the people of God in faraway places. He cared about them when they were suffering. And the question that we should ask ourselves is this. Do we care about God's people? in other places in this world who are suffering. You see, I think there's a danger for any church to only care about their own place, their own church. Are we looking for opportunities to identify with God's people throughout this world? You know, part of the reason for getting engaged in missions it's not necessarily that the gospel has not gone to the ends of the earth. It has. But friends, there are churches in other parts of this world. Churches that might be suffering because they don't have the, the theological richness that we do. They might also be suffering because they don't have economic means. And so when we get engaged in missions, it's an opportunity for us to declare that the church is bigger than just Lake Tanglewood, that the church is bigger than the panhandle of Texas, that God's church stretches through the ends of the earth. We're a part of something bigger than us. Daniel identified with God's church. Daniel wept over the condition of God's church. And Daniel is comforted by a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Let's read together verses 4 through 9. This is our second movement. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked. Behold, a man clothed in linen, with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but the great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone, and I saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and I heard the sound of his words. I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. Our chapter began with the third year of Cyrus, important dating scheme in Jewish life. Verse 4, we learn about another important date. It's the 24th day of the first month. If you were a Jew, you would know that this would coincide with the feast of both Passover and unleavened bread. That feast was a day of celebration for the Jews. But for Daniel, it was a time of mourning. As Daniel is standing on the banks of the Tigris River, something incredible happens to him. He sees a messenger from God who appears as a man. If you were to read the opening chapter of Ezekiel, you're going to find many of the same images surrounding the throne of God that you see in verses 5 and 6 of Daniel 10. Later on, if we skip ahead to the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, what we're going to find out is this exact terminology is used to describe Jesus. I want to read it to you. I want you to hear it. It's Revelation 1, verses 12 to 15. John is now seeing Christ, and this is what he says. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. Think about the similarity now between what Daniel saw and what John saw. Daniel saw this radiant appearance of God. John saw the same appearance. Daniel is thinking about the church in faraway places when this vision happens. Think about the context of John's vision. He saw the Son of Man standing among the churches, the seven lampstands. A lot of similarities in these two images. God is in the midst of His people who are suffering. God knows what His people are going through. And God cares. Now, there's some difficulty in this text. You see, I don't know if you've read commentaries or maybe you've listened to other theologians on this topic. But some, when they get to, to verses 5 and 6, they're a little bit resistant to say that that this is Jesus in the Old Testament. And the reason why they're resistant is because of verse 13. We'll read it in more detail later, but it describes this same person being hindered for 21 days. Theologians would say something like this, if this is Jesus in the Old Testament, like I'm telling you, then how in the world could the sovereign God who made everything that exists be hindered by an evil force? 
for 21 days? It's a good question. However, I think there's a good answer for it. I think what Daniel is showing us very early on is a theology of the cross. I want you to think about the ministry of Jesus with me for a moment. Jesus, from the very beginning of his ministry, he's baptized, and then what happens next? He goes into the wilderness. What is he doing in the wilderness? This is not a men's retreat. (laughs) He didn't go to the wilderness to hunt pheasant. He went to the wilderness because there he would do battle with the devil. The devil would tempt him for 40 days. He would eat nothing during that time. And the devil would tempt him to go about his life mission in another way, another manner than what God the Father had laid out for him. Now, I would argue that the ministry of Christ is all over the Old Testament. If you think about Genesis chapter 3, what does it tell us about Jesus' ministry? It tells us that the serpent will strike at him, but he will crush the serpent's head. It tells us that the serpent will attempt to wound him, but he will prevail. You read through the Psalms. David speaks about Jesus' death and resurrection. Here's the point the devil knows the Bible. James tells us that. Probably has the whole Old Testament memorized. I would argue that the devil knows exactly what the Son is going to do. And he hates it. And he fights against that mission. We can see an echo of this even in the Old Testament. When Jesus comes out of the wilderness experience, Matthew chapter 4, verse 11. He is ministered to by angels in a similar manner. We'll read about Daniel 10 and 13, where the Son of Man is ministered to, is aided by the angel Michael. Point of all this is that Daniel is giving us a vision of Jesus and his ministry. It's a ministry in which the Son of Man suffers. It's a ministry in which he dies. But it's a ministry in which he is resurrected and ascends unto glory. You see, at this moment in Daniel's life, he's hurting. What comforts you from Scripture when you're going through those times where you think, I I just can't go on. Maybe that's right now. What's comforting to know that the Son of God laid His life down for you. That the Son of God died in your place. You need to know that He has gone through more than you ever will in order to save you. Daniel has seen the Son of Man, and now he experiences the reaction to seeing God. Verses 7 through 9 speak about that. He falls on his face. Now again, if you read through the whole of Scripture, You compare this to other places where a vision of Christ happens. And I'll give you the exact text. Acts chapter 9. Paul's on the road to Damascus. He's on a mission. The mission is to destroy the church in other places in the world. So he's headed to Damascus and something happens. He meets Christ face to face. Jesus speaks with him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul asked, who are you, God? Who are you, Yahweh? God answers, I am Jesus, 
whom you are persecuting. What happens to Saul at that point? Boom, he hits the deck. He's undone. Those around Saul, they heard the sound, but they didn't see the vision. Think about this. Those around Daniel, what happens to them? They hear the sound of God, but they don't see Him. They respond in a similar way that Paul's companions did on the road to Damascus. Let's read together verses 8 through 9. So I was left alone. I saw this great vision and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words. And as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. Daniel is helpless. He's undone. Question. What happens when we truly experience the glory of God? It's a good question to ask, isn't it? Because many people will say things like, oh, that was glorious. Or maybe they'll go to a retreat like our men went to this weekend or or They'll go to maybe a Christian concert. How is the glory of God described at a Christian concert? Have you been to one recently? Yeah. It looks a lot like this, doesn't it? You know, and then if you're not doing that, the person next to you will say, what's wrong with him? He's not raising his hands like the rest of us. I mean, come on! This is glorious. When man encounters the glory of God in the Bible, does he look like this? I would say no. He looks like this. You know? Ah! I'm about to be annihilated. I've got to find a hole and hide in it. Because God is here. And that's exactly what Daniel does. The question is, Why does he do that? What was it about God that scared the daylights out of him? Well, I think it might be something related to God's holiness, his purity. When we come into contact with the holy God, we realize I'm not like him. And it scares us. Now, from time to time, we like to trick ourselves, don't we? You ever play the game of comparison? You know, Christian comparison? Billy Graham's dead, so, you know, we'll we'll throw him out there. You know, I'm not as good as Billy Graham, but I'm not as bad as, you know, (laughs) whatever person you want to throw out there. I'm somewhere in the middle. You know, I'm in the gray area, so, so I'm good to go. Well, not really. When we compare ourselves to the living God, He is holy, holy, holy. And we are not, not, not. God is not like us. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. Daniel knows this. He's undone. Picking up at verse 10 through the first verse of chapter 11. Daniel's going to learn about spiritual warfare. Read with me. Behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you. Stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words had been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. 
and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days or in the end days. For the vision is for the days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O oh my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's strength or servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O oh man, greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. And he spoke to me. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side except Michael, your prince. And as for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. Again, you've got to realize that the events that are unfolding, the end of the book of Daniel, this final vision, and the strength that Daniel receives from Christ in this vision is in response to prayer. We learned several weeks ago in our experiment called a prayer visual we learned that prayer is powerful, did we not? In a 24-hour period, the person that we were praying for received a heart. The transplant went well. Jeannie was not only breathing on her own, her heart was beating on her own. And in a 24-hour period, she walked around the hospital, start to finish. Prayer is a very powerful weapon, never underestimated. God's hand is upon Daniel. He's encouraged. He's told to stand up. And now Jesus explains why there was what seemed to be a delay in the answer to Daniel's prayer. Verses 13 and 14 is somewhat mysterious. Let me make it a little bit more clear. Daniel is told that the kingdom of Persia has been propped up by an evil entity, probably a demonic presence, and that the kingdom of Persia has been struggling or fighting with God. I think Daniel is learning that the ultimate power struggle is not fought between nations and peoples. The power centers are not Washington, D.C. and Moscow. The central point of this tension is not in the Middle East. The words of Sinclair Ferguson, the world crisis we identify with some of these locations are actually reflections of an older, more ruthless, perpetual conflict Namely, that between the city of God with its angelic host and the kingdom of darkness, which seeks to turn the direction of all human history against God and his people. You see, the devil and his minions are a lot like puppeteers. They are pulling the strings of world leaders, making them hostile to the people of God. Have you ever wondered why is it that nations always seem to devolve instead of evolve? They get worse, not better. Why? Why is it that they're opposed to the church? Well, my friends, the spiritual realm does influence the political realm. Daniel has seen the second person of the divine trinity. Notice... He's sent 
by the Father on a mission. That should ring a bell with us when we read the Gospels. Jesus will say, I didn't come on my own. I was sent by the Father to you. He sees one who looks like a man. I think that's very important. You saw it twice, once in verse 16 and again later on in the text. This one looks like a man, but he's divine. I would say that is God the Son. He also speaks about another entity, an angel by the name of Michael. Uh, Michael's a good name. In Hebrew, it means who is like God. Michael is mentioned three times in Daniel 10. If you're counting, verse 13. In verse 21, he's mentioned twice. He's mentioned once in the book of Jude, Jude verse 9, where he's described as an archangel. He's mentioned as well in Revelation 12 in verse 7, where he is described as the protector of of God's people. Michael is the closest thing that we get in Scripture to the concept of a guardian angel. He's a guardian angel who is in charge of protecting the people of God. What does that tell us? It tells us you're in a conflict. Whether you see it with your eyes or not, you're involved in a war. Now, Christ has made something known to Daniel. What has he told him? He's told him about the end of times. That's very interesting. Jesus is talking about the end of days, but note this. He's talking about realities that are happening in Daniel's lifetime. The rise of the kingdom of Persia, the rise of the kingdom of the Greeks, He's also, in this one final vision, going to talk about the final resurrection of the dead, the final judgment, the end of the age. So what he's telling us is that the end times is now for Daniel, but it's also not yet. The same is true for us. Jesus strengthens Daniel in order that he might understand the end. Daniel is touched in verse 18 by Christ. The Son of Man could have destroyed him. Think about that with me. This is the God that has made everything. And instead of obliterating Daniel, he touches him. He strengthens him. He wants Daniel to understand the times. He wants Daniel to understand what is behind the scenes in human history. There is an ancient conflict. It will wage from Daniel's day until the very end. In other words, it will span millennia. But it's really the same conflict. Satan's purpose for the nations, nations like Persia, like Greece, and many others in the history of the world, is to afflict and try to destroy the people of God. That is the agenda of the nations. However, Jesus tells us that not even the gates of hell can conquer his church. Friends, you've got to understand, things are not the way they appear. When we see the newspaper headlines, we we typically just look at Maybe world politics that happens, or or we look at natural disasters that happen, or we look at other events that happen, and we're prone to think, oh, you know, man is making history. Or others will say, boy, I really hope man can save the planet. (laughs) Friends, headlines in the newspaper ultimately have everything to do with the great spiritual conflict. It gives us the answer of why are these things happening? The devil often likes to hide, though. And that, I think, is one of his tactics. Fool them into thinking that this is just a naturalistic world. 
fool them into thinking that they can either destroy it or save it all on their own. Deceive them. Daniel 10, if it teaches us anything, it teaches us that we're at war. It teaches us that the Christian life is never a vacation. It's a battlefield. Friends, we are all engaged in this battle. And you're on either one of two sides. You're either on the side of the devil and his minions, or you are identified with the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ. But make no mistake about it, there is no middle ground. There's no neutrality. Be encouraged. This final vision tells you the good news. The triune God will have the victory. And he will bring the end with the person and the work of his son. Please stand. Lord God, we thank you that you control human history, that you have had a plan ever before the foundation of the world to save a people through the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we are at war. Let us remember that every day as we face our own enemy on the field of battle, an enemy that tries to discourage us, an enemy that tries to deceive us. Lord, we are are in your army. Let us never forget that. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord our God cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May our God, Son of Man, give you peace. You are dismissed.